you uh, are uh, um, working at the Asia Foundation uh, for nearly 20 years in the various positions. And uh, now you are, uh, you also manage a lot of program with ASEAN. Um, uh, and then you, um, you will speak about uh, the, uh, the topic of prospect for a multipolarity in ASEAN. And I hope you can also uh, make some, some remarks about uh, the, the American uh, uh, vision of, of, of this, uh, uh, the, the Indo-Pacific. Thank you so much, Thomas. Uh, I, I let you use the floor. Thank you so much, Professor Tran. Um, can you see my slides? Yes, perfect. Okay, great, great. Okay, great. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I really, uh, uh, it's an honor to be here with all of you. Um, while I am from the US, I have to admit, I'm, I'm not planning to speak very much from a US perspective, although I'm happy to do my best to uh, articulate that in the, uh, in the question and answer if, if necessary. Um, the, the, the topic I'm hoping to talk about today is really to look at uh, projecting ahead the next few decades in Southeast Asia to try to get a sense of what is the direction we're heading. Um, are we looking at a future which will be a, a bipolar uh, structure uh, organized around the US uh, and China rivalry? Are we looking at increasing Chinese hegemonic influence in the region? Or are we looking at something more along the lines of multipolarity, which arguably is, is where we are now, but can this be preserved uh, in, a, in an era of increasing great power competition? So the way I'm gonna organize uh, my, my discussion today is, is really trying to look, unpack this a bit initially by looking at, okay, if we are moving towards um, um, either bipolarity or, or, or um, Chinese hegemonic influence in the region, we would see some evidence of that today. Uh, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to unpack the evidence to, to look at what are we seeing actually uh, and, and make some predictions based on that. And then second, um, I'm gonna try to make the argument that it is possible to preserve multipolarity in this region, um, but that there's a few things that need to happen uh, for, this, uh, for this to uh, um, actually take place. Part of what I'd like to do is, is really start from the perspective of a lot of the scholarship, particularly in the United States, has been looking at Southeast Asia through the lens of US-China rivalry. Um, and it's, if you look at it purely through that lens, it's pretty easy to see the idea of a declining US um, strategic influence in the region and a rising China. And so it seems to project a certain answer of a, a sort of inevitability of Chinese influence in the region. Um, when in fact, I would argue that in Southeast Asia today, we're seeing actually a, an enormous diversification uh, and a movement towards multipolarity that we have not seen really uh, for, for, for many, many uh, decades. Um, so the discussion of an emerging hegemonic influence in the region is really quite premature. And I'll show you some evidence in a minute which sort of gets to that point. Um, contrary, I think, to predictions of a new Cold War, Southeast Asia is actually becoming more diversified. And so when I, when I try to use the term hegemony, um, it, it, it usually would infer some degree of crowding out of other external powers um, as, as one dominant power or two dominant powers basically um, crowd out those other actors. But the evidence actually is quite the opposite. Um, a couple of points just to, just to emphasize. For example, um, in trade, uh, this is an area of course that is often described as, as an area that China is extremely um, important on. Now, of course that's true from 2000 to 2010, um, Chinese, um, ASEAN's exports to China rose dramatically. And as of 2019, uh, China was a roughly 14% of ASEAN's exports. But yet from 2010, to 2019, it actually only grew from 12% to 14%. So the degree of growth of, of the importance of, of China as an export destination for ASEAN is actually starting to slow and even taper off. Um, and in fact, actually, it's nowhere near um, the dominance of the US, even in the early 90s, when the US was uh, more than 20% of ASEAN's exports. Similarly, I think we see this in investment. Um, where, uh, oh, sorry, one more point on trade. 
it's often, while yes, China is the number one trading partner for ASEAN, um, it's actually not the number one trading partner for every ASEAN country. This is, uh, as Malcolm Cook uh, recently wrote, it's an oft-repeated claim that China is the top trading partner for Southeast Asian, every so Southeast Asian economy, when it's actually a prediction presented as a reality. Um, for example, uh, Cambodia. China is actually only the fifth largest export destination for Cambodian exports. Um, for Lao PDR, right on the border with China, actually Thailand is the largest export destination. So it's actually much more complex than is often assumed. Um, and on the area of foreign direct investment, um, in 2019, China was only 5.6% of, of overall FDI to Southeast Asia after peaking at 10% in 2017. So it's actually been on the decline over the last uh, three years uh, up till 20, 2019. Um, the main contributors, of course, are the US, Japan, and the European Union. Um, so let me go on to the next point. Um, I could talk as well about outbound travel and uh, studying abroad, but I don't think I have time right now. Another way to try to unpack this is let's, let's look at the period that we know of past hegemonic influence in this region, most recently, of course, during the Cold War. Now, if we look, if we do a comparison of how Southeast Asia looks today and how it looked during the Cold War, it is dramatically different. Um, for example, if we look at arms purchases, um, during the 1960s, if we look at the ASEAN five original members, um, they procured arms almost exclusively from a single partner. Um, for example, 83% uh, during the 1960s, 83% of arms purchases came from the top supplier for each country. So for example, Thailand purchased 96% of its arms from the United States in the 1960s. Indonesia actually purchased most of its weapons from the Soviet Union. Um, but if you fast forward to today, um, or during the 2010s, for example, um, it's completely different. The ASEAN 5 actually procured only 28% of their arms um, on average from their top provider. Um, and in fact, the average number of countries providing um, uh, arms to each individual ASEAN country was more than 18 different countries. Um, so there's a dramatic diversification of arms uh, procurement uh, for Southeast Asian countries. We certainly don't see the level of dependence that we saw during the Cold War. Um, if we look at, for example, the uh, Southeast Asian economies um, have grown dramatically as we know. In the 1960s, Southeast Asia was only 3% of the US economy and had very few trading partners compared to today. Now today, it's approaching 20% of the US economy and it's a huge diversity of trading partners as we know. One small anecdotal point, which came from a, a book that Benjamin Zawaki wrote recently, is that in the late 1960s, the United States government was the second largest employer in Thailand, next to only the Thai government. Today, it almost certainly doesn't even rank in the top 1,000 uh, employers in Thailand. Um, and so the, the prominence of the superpower patrons just is not even close to the way it was uh, in, in, in during the Cold War. And then finally, in terms of foreign aid dependency, um, I've been looking particularly at Lao PDR and its dependency on foreign aid. During the 1960s and early 1970s, almost 80% of Lao's foreign aid uh, came from the United States and the rest was mostly from France and other partners of the United States. After the Pethet Lao victory in 1975, for the next 10 years, almost 95% was from the Soviet Union. So this was a clear indicator of, 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 of total um, dependence on a superpower patron. Today, of course, all of the countries in ASEAN have dramatic diversification of, of sources of foreign aid and half of the countries in the region are actually foreign aid providers themselves. Um, and so the, the, the dynamics that we saw during the Cold War simply aren't there anymore. A third point that I think is very important to emphasize and that we've heard a bit before um, is just that actually in many cases there are already multiple poles in the region. So in speaking with a, a senior Thai diplomat recently, um, they indicated, look, for the last three decades, we have seen uh, Southeast Asia as, a, as actually three poles, Japan, the US and China um, in the post-Cold War uh, era. Japan is, is often considered uh, a geopolitical pole in and of itself. India increasingly is also seeing on the trajectory of becoming a major pole. Um, and if we look at the, the influence um, of Japan 
um, in, in the region, particularly, for example, on infrastructure. Just here, uh, this is a bridge that's actually very close to my house here, uh, the Bumipon Bridge here in Bangkok. Of the 17 bridges over the Chao Phraya River in the Bangkok area, 13 of them were built or financed by the Japanese. Um, and the Chinese um, major construction uh, on the, along the Belt and Road is the high-speed rail, which is actually Thai financed. Um, so it's, it's really not even comparable. And if you look at Japan's role in, in infrastructure support in the region, Japan is actually by far um, providing more infrastructure support uh, than China is in the region. So, and that's particularly so actually in Vietnam. Okay. All right, so now if we look at, at what it's gonna take uh, to, to preserve multipolarity in the region, um, I'm gonna basically try to go at this in, in a few different ways and quickly wrap up. Um, first, as we know and have heard uh, over the last day and a half, Southeast Asia is becoming a critical theater of geopolitical competition. But it's also becoming a very crowded field. Um, and we're seeing this in a whole range of areas. I, I know that uh, you know, we heard before about the Paris, Delhi, Canberra axis, which is very, very interesting. We've also heard about the UK-Japan partnership, which is emerging. Japan and Europe in many ways are no longer sort of the economic giants with no significant security role in Southeast Asia. In fact, in many ways, Japan and Europe are interested in playing a greater security role in the region. Um, and so that means that it's not just a US-led effort uh, um, on, on security in the South China Sea, for example. Um, the age of alliances in a lot of ways, I think uh, we've heard this from many scholars, is really starting to fade. And certainly here in Southeast Asia, we're seeing a situation where nobody is interested in signing up for rigid alliance structures the way we saw during the Cold War. There's much more interest in a more ad hoc um, pluralization of different mechanisms between like-minded countries for different purposes. So the idea that ASEAN plays a certain set of roles, the Quad plays another set of roles, and then there's other plurilateral and minilateral sort of mechanisms which play other functions, I think is absolutely the way of the future. Um, all of these dynamics in many ways are playing to Southeast Asia's benefit. Um, and I think that in a lot of ways, the proliferation of independent geopolitical actors in this region is giving Southeast Asian countries a lot of options and they're taking advantage of those options. As they try to avoid making the choice between China and the US in that, in that um, bipolar, bipolar um, sort of competition, um, it's much easier in fact for them to work with other external powers um, who are increasingly offering more to the region um, and it doesn't come with the baggage of, of, a, of a close partnership with China or the US. But it's important as well to understand external powers and how they can, the role that they can play, the value that they provide to the region um, and how they can play a greater role to try to help the region avoid um, a, a, a scenario which would go down a bipolar uh, a, a pathway. So, you know, I, I think it's important really to emphasize this, this role of the rise of alternative powers. Um, and actually I'm in the process of, uh, of research for a new book, which is gonna look at the role of India, Japan, Australia, and Europe um, in trying to provide more options uh, for Southeast Asia and what this means for the future of the region and the, and the regional order. Um, just two more slides, Professor John, sorry, I'll try to wrap up. Um, We've heard extensively as well, and I think it's important as well, that Southeast Asia has a great deal of agency in how the region is shaped. Um, we're not looking at a, a region anymore that is waiting for external powers to shape the regional order on its behalf um, or without its participation. Um, in fact, we're looking at a situation where countries in the region are developing um, very, very finely tuned and very effective mechanisms for managing their relations with the superpowers. Um, for example, if we look at, there's a lot of particular examples where um, superpowers simply haven't been able to get their way with Southeast Asian countries. And it's, it's actually directly attributable to how Southeast Asian countries are managing those relations often through hedging and through other mechanisms like ASEAN. Um, if you look, for example, at China's role in the Mekong um, or the US's efforts to try to um, 
be very, very assertive in the South China Sea in backing up um, uh, maritime littoral, littoral states claims, um, you see actually that uh, Southeast Asian countries prefer to manage things on their own. Um, and that there's, it's, it's become quite confusing and frustrating in many cases uh, for the superpower that's trying to get its way. Okay. And then finally on ASEAN, um, you know, I think that ASEAN is, is, uh, is you know, much maligned and, and much criticized, especially with the Myanmar coup uh, situation recently. Um, but in many ways, I would argue that ASEAN is doing exactly what it was designed to do. Um, ASEAN was created at a time when the region was emerging from centuries of external power um, intervention and imposition uh, in the region. Um, and its founding principle as a result was to prevent interference in the region um, and in the, in the individual uh, affairs of, of individual member states. So it, 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 it absolutely makes sense that the region would really hold that as a first principle uh, of trying to prevent internal, uh, internal manipulation um, by external powers. Now, I think that ASEAN's role, for example, on the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific is very, very promising. Now, of course, um, this, is, you know, this is driven by individual member states, particularly Indonesia, um, although I know many of my Thai friends would say that it was a Thai initiative. Um, but ultimately, this is a great example of ASEAN trying to reframe a concept in a way which would be beneficial uh, and would decrease the pressure on individual um, ASEAN member states. Um, and so I know that a lot of external powers like Australia and Japan are looking for ways to try to align with and support um, the AOIP in, in meaningful ways once the pandemic has cleared. And just one brief point on the Quad. Well, certainly a number of countries in the region would look at the Quad as a useful balancing mechanism vis-a-vis um, -vis China. At the same time, I think it's important to understand why many Southeast Asian leaders are so anxious about the Quad. While yes, it does undermine ASEAN centrality, and that's the argument that's often described as the main point, I would also argue that as the Quad becomes more significant um, and becomes a major organizing feature of, of the regional order, it in some ways has a path dependency towards a bipolar structure, which is directly against the interests of most Southeast Asian countries. Um, and so I think that ultimately that's in the back of many of the minds of Southeast Asian leaders uh, as to why they're so nervous about the Quad. And I will Thank stop you. There. Thank you, uh, Thomas, for uh, your presentation and uh, to uh, remind us to co with your comparison uh, with the period of Cold War is was very interesting and uh, to, to, um, to insist about the fact that uh, most of the country in the region uh, do, do not want to let the great powers to decide for them after the, the colonial period and the Cold War. It's very important to, to insist about the, the, the reality of the multipolarity and the alternative powers. So thank you a lot for uh, this presentation.